Jesus. The whole of scripture, the whole point of scripture is to point us to Jesus. But last week, Tristan started the series, he looked at Exodus 1 and the start of Exodus 2. And I just thought it might be a bit useful to have a bit of a recap of how we get to the events of Exodus. Um, so if you remember, in Genesis, the first book in the Bible, there was a famine in the whole region of uh, Egypt and Israel and all of that region. But because of divine foresight given to Joseph, remember Joseph, he had a coat of technical dream coat, he had a coat of many colours, him. Egypt had food. So the whole of the, the whole of the region was in famine, but Egypt has had food. And they, in Egypt, because of Joseph's divine foresight of, the, of what God had given to Joseph, they were well equipped to survive the famine. And so Joseph, I know it's a very long story, but you can read it in, Ex, uh, in Genesis, it's a great, great story. Because, of, because Joseph had found fa favour with Pharaoh, who he was the prime minister of, he was working for, the whole of Joseph's family relocated to Egypt. And they were given a region in Egypt as their very own area to live in, if you like. And as a result of that, they multiplied. They were, they were fruitful. Just as God had promised Abraham, one of their forefathers, in Genesis 15. But, as we saw in Exodus 1, times had changed a lot for the Israelites. 400 years had passed. Leadership of Israel had changed quite a few times, of Egypt had changed quite a few times. And the present Pharaoh knew nothing about Joseph. And to him, the Israelites, they were a threat because there were so many of them. And as has been the case throughout the ages, when leaders feel threatened, they use their power to subdue and to oppress. And that's what Pharaoh did. They think that the Israelite slaves, they created the pyramids, they built the pyramids. So, so um, his, Pharaoh's idea was to oppress and subdue the Israelites, but the plan backfired. God's intention was to bless and multiply. So, Pharaoh, because he was a dictator, because he, uh, he wanted to subdue and oppress, he decided to get rid of the threat of these pesky Israelites by um, killing all newborn baby boys. And as Tristan was talking about last week, it's a genocide at its very, very worst. But in the middle of the horror of this situation, there's hope. Into this situation, there's born a baby boy, an Israelite, who was shielded in a basket, placed in the reeds near the banks of the Nile, and it just so happens that Pharaoh's daughter found the baby, found the baby, adopted him, and then asked his own mother to look after him. Now, is that a happy coincidence? Is that, you know, oof, that's a real coincidence, isn't that a great thing? Oh, God's divine plan. And what obviously we, we know from the story, it's God's divine plan. So, we're going to come to uh, the second half of chapter 2. We are reading from Exodus, chapter 2, starting at verse 11. It should come up on the screen. I'm sorry, it's a, I'm sorry it's a bit small. I'm really sorry it's a bit small. But if you've got your Bible or on your phone, it'll be a lot bigger for you. Uh, so, Exodus, chapter 2, verse 11. And I am reading from the New Living Translation. So, this is it. So remember, Tristan finished off last week, verse 10, 
says, uh, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter who had adopted him. Uh, she called him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. So this is verse 11. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who had started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking, everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened and he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw water and fill the water troughs for their father's flocks. But some of the shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. When the girls returned to rule their father, he asked, Why are you back so soon today? An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Then where is he? Their father asked. Why did you leave him there? Invited to come and eat with us. Moses accepted the invitation and he settled there with them. In time, Reuel gave Moses' daughter Zipporah to be his wife. Later she gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom. For he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Years passed and the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. So, as we see in our passage, Moses is now an adult. And this is where the Bible can be really, really frustrating, can't it? Because it lacks detail. You know, we've suddenly, we've got, got Moses as a baby being drawn out of the Nile. And suddenly, he's an adult. What has happened to him in the time from him being brought out of the water up to now? And to, find, to fill in a few of the gaps, we need to pop into the New Testament to Acts chapter 7. Let's just uh, read a little bit of that. So if you remember Stephen, who um, was the first Christian martyr, he is preaching at this point in Acts chapter 7 to the Sanhedrin. And he's given them a reminder of, the, of Israel's history in order to preach. And this is what he says, Acts chapter 7, verse 20 to 29. So he's retelling what the story that I've just told. At that time, Moses was born a beautiful child in God's eyes. His parents cared for him at home for three months. When they had to, when they had to abandon him, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and raised him as her own son. Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both speech, speech and action. One day, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, the people of Israel. He saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite. So Moses came to the man's defence and avenged him, killing the Egyptian. Moses assumed his fellow Israelites would realise that God had sent him to rescue them, but they didn't. The next day, he visited them again and saw two men of Israel fighting. He tried to be a peacemaker. Men, he said, you are brothers. Why are you fighting each other? But the man in the wrong pushed Moses aside. Who made you a ruler and judge over us, he asked. Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard that, he fled the country and lived as a foreigner in the land of Midian. There, his two sons were born. Same story, two people telling the same story. Stephen, filling in a little bit of the details that we don't see in Exodus. So, firstly, 
We know that after his adoption, Moses led this privileged life. If you look at verse 22 of Acts, it says, it says, Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was powerful in both speech and action. Some commentators, they suggest that Moses uh, was uh, uh, a military leader for Egypt um, up until that time. They suggest that he might have led Egyptians into battle. And some commentators suggest, obviously we don't know, but they suggest that he might have been being groomed to become the next Pharaoh because Pharaoh didn't have any sons. So we also find out that when the action of Exodus 2 starts, Moses is 40. He's 40. And 40 in the Bible is a very, very significant number, which we will find out uh, about in the, in the next few weeks, I am sure. But in, in 40 in the Bible represents a time of testing. So Moses has been 40 years in Egypt. And so if we look, if we look at uh, verse 11, we find that Moses goes out to his own people, but he was brought up as an Egyptian, as well as knowing that he was an Israelite by birth. And as Tristan said last week, this must have been due to his adopted mother, his, you know, the, the Egyptian princess. But in this passage, we see different sides to Moses' character. He has a heart for the oppressed. He could have completely ignored the fact that he was Israelite and lived in the splendor of, of, of Pharaoh's palace. He had, he, and even at this point, he might well have seen himself as the person who would save his, person, his people from slavery. But in verse 13, we see the actions of a very, very impulsive man. We see the actions of someone who acts before he thinks. He knows it's wrong to kill that Egyptian because the text said he looks this way and he looks that way to see whether anyone is watching. So he knew it was wrong because he didn't want to get found out, but he did it anyway. At that point, Moses' self-will takes control. Now, what was Moses thinking at this point? Was he thinking that he'd take on all these Egyptian slave masters, you know, one, one, one at a time? The truth is, really, he probably wasn't thinking at all. Probably, have you ever had when you've read Misty Sends and you do not think at all? And we do things that we would never do normally because we haven't thought about it. Now, this morning, we probably haven't murdered anybody, but we might have murdered someone with our words. We might see red and speak harshly to someone without stopping to think of the consequences. We might well have said things that we don't mean. We might have even lashed out in anger and hit someone. You might have hit your brother or sister. Occasionally. You might have spread that juicy tidbit of gossip about someone. We all do it. We all do it. We might wonder how Moses could have murdered someone, but read misty sense. And we do things, we do things without thinking. We are all like Moses, one way or another. So I bet everyone has heard the saying, be sure your sins will find you out. Be sure your sins will find you out. And that's what happened. The next day, Moses is trying to intervene in a dispute between two Israelites. And he's basically given short shrift, isn't he? They're saying, who do, you, who do you think you are telling us what to do when you have murdered someone? Now, what must Moses have been thinking at this point? His motives were good. He wanted to identify 
not with the privileges and riches of Egyptian life, but with slaves who, who worship the true God. He had a heart for the oppressed. He was righteously angry. He was righteously angered by suffering. These were all admirable qualities. But in verses 11 to 14, we see a man who does things in his own strength. He dances to his own tune. He assumes that God is lucky to have him on his team. And the wonderful thing is that in God's grace, that calling, even though Moses looked up, that calling was never revoked despite Moses' shortcomings. But in God's providence, through the events that follow, Moses is involved in God's training scheme. Yes, Moses was God's choice to lead the Israelites out of slavery, but God wanted to develop in Moses the qualities that he knew that Moses would need. God wanted his kind of leader, not the type of leader that Moses assumed God would want. He, God wanted to teach Moses about himself. Now the, the American preacher D.L. Moody said this, Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was a somebody. He spent his next 40 years learning he was a nobody. And he spent his last 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. And how God dealt with Moses is often the way that God deals with us. So what we're going to do today, we're going to think of some things that God's training scheme for Moses achieved in his life because it's the same for us. So the first thing we need to know is that no experience in God's training scheme is wasted. No experience. Now, have you ever seen the film The Karate Kid? Have you yeah. seen it? Yeah. Ever seen it? Okay. Now, as a teenager, it was one of my favourite films. Obviously, the original and best. <laughs> the Ralph Macchio version. None of this you know, um, what's he called? Jaden Smith. Jaden, not, not this Jaden Smith going to China, that's just rubbish, right? So in the story, in the original best, Karate Kid, Ralph, Ma uh, Ralph Macchio's character, Daniel LaRusso he's called, is being bullied. And he wants to learn how to take on his tormentors. And he enlists the help of Mr. Miyagi. Now Mr. Miyagi, he's an old man, but he's a karate expert. But to Danny's amusement, Mr. Miyagi gets him doing all sorts of jobs that is completely unrelated to karate. Do you remember? He has to sand the floor. He has to paint the fence in a certain way. He has to clean his car. Do you remember? Wax on, wax off. Do you remember? Oh, to raise, you remember? Now, Daniel is discouraged. He wants to, he, what's Mr. Miyagi going on about? I want to learn some karate moves. He has talent. Why isn't he being taught karate moves? But all is revealed later. When he is put into situations during matches, that the moves he has learned by doing Mr. Miyagi's chores are used to great effect. Now, do you see the, see the comparison with Moses? Moses lives as a son of the royal family. God enabled Moses to gain knowledge of Egyptian culture, how the royal family worked, how Egyptians think, what made pharaohs tick, how protocol worked. He gave him experience in leadership and humanly speaking, we might assume that Moses was on a fast track to the senior leadership team of, of Egypt. But God had other priorities for, for, for Moses. None, but none of those first 40, 40 years of Moses' life was wasted. None at all. But God wanted to produce qualities in Moses he would never be able to do while he lived in Egypt. Now let's make this personal for us. 
Are you aware this morning, you might be, of something that God has put on your heart? There might be something that you feel passionate about. Or do you get a sense that God has something that he wants you to do for him, but nothing is happening? You feel frustrated. You feel dissatisfied. You think, does God really, really know what he's doing? Has he forgotten me? Remember, no experience is wasted. God has a personal development plan for each of us. I'll repeat that again because it's important. God, no matter what our age or experience, God has a personal development plan for each of us. But it's also encouraging to know, isn't it, that our failures are not final in God's training scheme. And um, I read, while I was preparing, I read that a, a promising junior executive at IBM was involved in a risky venture. And it, he, he, this, this, uh, this junior executive lost the company, IBM, $10 million. That's quite a lot, isn't it? Now, eventually, the nervous executive gets the inevitable call into the boss's office. And he goes in, and before the boss has, has time to say anything, the young man says, or woman, says, I guess you want my resignation. The boss replies, you can't be serious. We've just spent $10 million educating you. <laughs> because, obviously, he was never, ever going to make that mistake again. God is in the business of using people who have failed. He uses our mistakes. He uses our, the good things that we've done, but he also uses our mistake, how wonderful he is. And it's great, isn't it, that the Bible doesn't sugarcoat the failures of the heroes of faith. Let's think of some. Abraham, father to many, many nations, his, his ancestors will be as, as much as the stars in the sky. Abraham lies about his wife being his sister, not only once, but he lies about it twice. Jacob, his grandson, deceives his father and cheats his brother out of his birthright. David, the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. The same David has an affair with a married woman, kills a husband to try and cover it up. Peter, one of Jesus' best mates, denies he never knows Jesus when the going gets tough. Paul, who writes basically half of the New Testament, murdered Christians and thought he was doing God a favour. Failure is never final with God. He uses our failures as tools to develop our characters in the personalised training scheme he has for each of us. So the first thing, it's so encouraging, isn't it, yeah. that no experience is wasted with God. Either positive or negative. What an encouragement that is. But the second thing we need to uh, remember is that God employs mentors in this training program that he has for us. So Moses runs away from Egypt and a very fair, angry Pharaoh, because Pharaoh wants to kill him, and he runs away to Midian. Now, could I just look, can we just look at the, uh, I've got a map, so we know where Midian is. So if we have a look at the map, um, I know not too, not too big. <laughs> so Egypt is on uh, the left hand side, Moses flees to, see where Arabia is, Midian is just left of that. It's a long, it's a long way. But as you, if you notice, you probably can't see on here, but M Midian is quite near Mount Sinai. And we'll be definitely looking to the significance of that mountain in a few weeks. So Moses flees to a region where he would return to years later. He goes to a place where the power of God and the glory of God was going to be powerfully seen. Coincidence? Oh, yeah, yeah. Out of all the places, yeah, yeah, I've just got to... No, no, no. 
No coincidence. Now, who are these Midianites? The Midianites were relations of the Israelites through Abraham, because after Sarah, Abraham's wife, Isaac's mum, she died, and Abraham took another wife called Keturah. And Keturah had six sons to Abraham, and one of them was called Midian. So the Midianites, at that point, they were still worshipping uh, the same God as Abraham. They, they went off the boil later on and, and worshipped other gods, but at that point, at that point, they were worshipping the same God as Moses. So, the seven daughters of a priest came to draw water from the well. They were being harassed by some shepherds, and Moses drives those shepherds away. Thankfully, using a lot less force than he did in Egypt. Maybe he's starting to learn his lesson. And he, we can see here that even then, Moses, he has a heart for the oppressed. So he has a heart for the oppressed Israelite, he has a heart for the oppressed. God is developing this heart for the oppressed person within Moses. He's given hospitality by the girl's father, who is called a priest of Midian. Now, it's a bit confusing in scripture because in this passage in Exodus 2, he's called Rule. But in the next chapter, he's called Jethro. What, you know, what, what's going on there? So, some commentators think that Ruel was his given name, like my given name is Helen, but Ruel means friend of God. Friend of God. Whereas Jethro was a title. So, I am Mrs. Helen Jenkinson. Jethro means your excellent, excellency. So, so there's no, there's no, um, there's no disparity. It's just different, different titles given to the same man. But the fact that he's called Your Excellency might indicate that he's quite a respected figure in the community. So Moses is found in a desert place, far from home, probably confused, disillusioned with the turn that his life had taken. But just as he's taken into Pharaoh's family for protection, he's taken into the protection of another family. But not just any old family. The head of the family is called a friend of God. Coincidence? No. No. Another stage in God's training program for him. Now, I really like Jethro. You know, when we read about him later on in Exodus, I really like, like Jethro. He's a really down-to-earth bloke. We see him later in Exodus. He visits Moses and gives him some good advice about how to deal with the Israelites when they're all falling out and, and stuff. He was the type of person that Moses could respect. Someone he could look up to. So part of God's training scheme for Moses was to bring someone into his life who he could learn from. We can imagine, can't we, Moses at first was a bit arrogant and a bit know-it-all, a bit sure of himself. But under the care and tutelage of Jethro, or Rule as he's called in Exodus 2, he is taught humility. Humility that was essential for shepherding the Israelites in the wilderness. He was learned how to be a shepherd. Now for an, for an Egyptian, shepherding was a no-go occupation. It was, it was considered far too demeaning. Moses took the role of a shepherd. But by doing that, he learned how to survive in the wilderness. He learned about the terrain that, they, that he would need to negotiate. All part of God's training program for Moses. Now, we all need Jethro's in our life. It's not necessarily our father-in-law's. Some of us have been blessed with the ones. He's not here this morning to hear that. <laughs> but it's not necessarily our father-in-law's. But we all need people who love us enough 
not just tell us what we want to hear, but who will tell us the truth in love. People we respect the opinion of, we all need Jeffros in our life. People who we know only have our best interests at heart. Now, if you have someone in that life, in your life, like Jethro, thank God for them and thank them too that they are Jethro to you. But if you don't have a Jethro sort of character in your life, pray that God will bring someone into your life who can be Jethro to you who can tell you the truth in love, who you know loves you enough to tell you it. Someone who you can take advice of, someone who is wiser than you are. We all, all need Jethro's in our life. So Moses' desert experience brought him blessing in the shape of Jethro. But it also brought with him the next lesson that Moses needed to learn. And that lesson was that God uses wilderness experiences in his training program. Here, remember, he was someone who for the first 40 years was probably used to having people bowing and scraping before him, seen to his every need. But his princely credentials were absolutely no advantage to him in his time in Midian. Being a prince and leading an army, weren't on his to-do list in Midian, caring and protecting his sheep in a barren land, that was the thing that was on his agenda. And Moses spent 40 years in this obscurity. Now, some of you are not yet 40. Right? Can you imagine the whole of your life doing that? Right? Can you can you imagine the whole of your life and longer caring for sheep? Those of us who are over 40, can you remember 40 years ago? It's a long time, isn't it? Nowadays, that's a whole person, a, a person's whole working life. So Moses spent his whole working, uh, uh, nowadays our whole working life looking after sheep. But it's a pattern we see through scripture. Before God uses people, they have time in obscurity. Let's have a think. Joseph, we mentioned him already this morning. He spent time in an Egyptian jail before becoming Prime Minister. Paul spent about three years in Arabia after his conversion. The ultimate example. Jesus spends 30 years in obscurity in a Galilean village before starting his ministry. And for all these people, obscurity was the opportunity for teaching, training, and character development. It was a time to discover more of what God's plan for them would entail. But the question for us is, are we willing to be obscure? Are we willing to serve God in ways that might not get noticed. Katie's just been talking about it this morning, haven't we, about service. Often, we want to do big, noticeable things for God, and we want them to do them on our own time scale. A bit like Moses in Egypt, sometimes we decide when God can have us on his team, and we think that God is fortunate to have such a talented individual as we are. But God might, under, might have other ideas. He might be wanting us to train us in this wilderness of obscurity. Are we willing to do things that some might consider menial? Are we willing to serve and keep serving even when no one notices? That might be a question, especially for those of us who are in leadership of any sort in the church, or maybe people who are, you know, you are a manager at work. Are we willing to be obscure? Are we willing to be doing the things that don't get, that don't get us noticed? 
But verse 22 gives us a window into how Moses had changed. He calls his son Gershom, which means foreigner. Now you can imagine at this point, Moses is sighing and thinking, oh well, I thought God was going to use me, but it seems I was wrong. Midian, it's all right. It doesn't feel like home, but never mind, I'm here. This is where I'll stay. We see a very different Moses, don't we? To the one who left Egypt. But then even at 80, remember he was 40 years as a shepherd, 40 years to Midian, 40 years as a shepherd. Even at age 80, God had other ideas for Moses' life. At the time, when lots of shepherds would be thinking about hanging up their crook and taking life easy, God had other ideas. So, octogenarians uh, in the congregation today, maybe you better watch out. You better watch out. Because God uses his trainee Moses to fulfill his covenant promises. God uses God used his trainee Moses to fulfill his covenant promises. Let's have just read, we'll read verse 23 to 25 in Exodus 2. Years passed, 40 years we know, and the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to grow under the, their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose out to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. The Israelites, they were enslaved in Egypt. The Texas, they groaned and cried out for help. They were desperate for God to intervene in their situation. And verse 24 says that God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this word remember in Hebrew is used in a much different way than we use it in English. In English, we think remember is the opposite to forget. I'd forgotten to do something, then I remembered. But in Hebrew, this word is used of God in relation to his covenant promises. It's all, God remembering is always followed by an action. So in these verses we see it wasn't of God a case of God being so busy with lots of other nations that he'd forgotten all about Egypt and then suddenly he remembers but that he had been working behind the scenes in training Moses. He'd been arranging circumstances so his people could leave Egypt in order to fulfill the, to fulfill the promise God had made to him. And I really like how verse 25 puts it. He, God, looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. That's encouraging, isn't it? Some of us might have been in a bad situation for a long time. We, some of us might have prayed for someone or something for years. Years and years. And it feels like God has but what we know, we know he hears our groaning from verse 24. He hears our groaning. He has never forgotten us. But he might be working behind the scenes in these situations. He, rem he hasn't changed. He remembers his covenant promises to us. And in his perfect timing, he will act perfect timing he will act. So God has a personalised training program for each one of us. No experience that we've had in the past or will have in the future is ever wasted. Often he employs mentors that model what he wants us to be like. People who love us enough to speak the truth to us in love. Listen if you've got one of those people in your life, listen to their godly wisdom. If you've not, pray for one. Pray that God brings one into your life. And for us, most of God's training 
program for us happens in obscurity. It happens in obscurity. Are we willing to serve without being noticed? Are we willing to serve without being thanked? God never forgets his promises to us. He hears our cries and our groaning. He works behind the scenes on our behalf. And this is the exciting thing. God might just be using you to bring about his sovereign purposes in the lives of others. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you this morning that you have a training programme for each one of us. We praise you that in your divine providence, no experience that we've had in the past or will have in the future is ever wasted. We thank you for those people in our life who are mentors to us, who speak your words to us. And Lord, we, I pray that if there's people here this morning who don't have that sort of person in their life, that you will bring that person to them. And Lord, we thank you that you work on us in obscurity. We thank you for the times when you have been working behind the scenes that we have no clue about. And Lord, we want to say this morning that we are wanting to be part of your plan. We are wanting to be part of your sovereign plan for other people and for this church, for this world that we live in. Amen.